Hello, you're watching The Daily Report. It's Friday, November 12th here in Korea. The number of severely ill COVID-19 patients is on the rise and health authorities in response are calling for active public participation in the country's booster campaign. We have more later on in the program. I have Kwon Soa standing by now with the broader pandemic coverage. So let's begin here on the local front. All right, Sunny. So we're seeing a decrease in infections as we're wrapping up the work week. Let's take a look at the figure tallied this Friday. 2,368 new infections as of 12 a.m. Now, apart from 10 cases uh, that are imported infections, uh, the rest of them are domestic infections. Now, uh, we've been seeing 2,000s in the past three days. Uh, but what's also a big concern right now is the number of patients that are in severe or critical condition because that figure has been in the 400s throughout the week and almost every day the number is uh, going up slightly. Now with that Korea has a total of 390,719 infections and with 18 new fat fatalities the death toll stands at 3,051. And uh, let's move over to our vaccination figures. 41.8 million people have received at least one COVID-19 jab and 39.8 million are fully vaccinated. Uh, in the capital Seoul as well as Gyeonggi-do province and Incheon, so the metropolitan region, there's been a drop in infections in the past day, but some places that have seen an increase are Chungcheong Namdo province as well as Jeolla Bukdo province. Uh, going abroad now, there are as you can see, the 20 countries with the highest number of accumulated cases, and there are still increases, especially in European countries like Germany, which is closely now uh, approaching the 5 million mark. Uh, let's also shift over to other countries that have more than 2 million infections. Thailand has just hit the 2 million mark in the past day when it comes to the total number of cases. Here you can see uh, the fatalities, uh, more than 19,000, almost 20,000 fatalities in Thailand. And uh, we're going to connect later to the Netherlands today. Uh, that's why we have that figure here, more than 2.2 million infections in total and over 18,000 fatalities. Uh, here you can see that Peru has um, a much higher fatality rate than other countries with over 200,000 fatalities in total. And uh, those are the general updates that I have for now, but I'll see you back in a bit. Sunny? All right, so uh, thank you for now. Right, health, author health authorities, that is, here in the country, have said the number of severely ill COVID-19 patients will play a pivotal role in our gradual transition to a new normal given the recent rise. But that is, given the recent rise in these numbers, uh, we are going to have to have Shin Yeun here in the studio with me to tell me about this rise in the severely ill COVID-19 patients. Right, Yeun? Yes, hello, Sunny. Right now, I hear our step into phase two of our exit strategy from the pandemic remains rather uncertain. Tell us more. Right. On Thursday, KDCA Chief Chung eun Gyeong cautioned that if the number keeps rising, the country could face difficulties in moving on to the second phase of our gradual return to normal scheme, which was set for December. Earlier this month, Korea began the process of gradually easing restrictions in three phases. Phase one kicked off last week with the relaxing of social gathering caps and business restrictions. The gradual easing steps are set to be rolled out in six week intervals, including a two week evaluation period. Assuming everything goes as planned, authorities have pinned December 13th as the first day of phase two, where measures would be further eased. But on this Friday, just a day after Chung's remarks, the number of patients in critical condition rose to 475, another all-time high. We've been seeing record high tallies for three consecutive days, which explain why authorities remain on high alert. Right. Yeon, on a bright note now, do tell us a bit about the recent vote of support for Korea's antibody treatment over in Europe. Right, so we are seeing some bright news here. Korean drug maker Celtrion has received the green light from the European Medicines Agency for its antibody therapy called Retcorona. Europe's drug regulators are recommending the treatment for adults who do not require extra oxygen support, yet are still at high risk of a severe illness. It's now awaiting approval from the European Commission for marketing authorization. Red Corona has been shown to lower the rate of hospitalizations and deaths. It's a monoclonal antibody that attaches itself to the virus and mimics natural human antibodies to fight infections. 
Right. Meanwhile, I hear Moderna's chief medical officer has spoken about the efficacy of the company's vaccine against breakthrough infections, Yen. That's definitely right. Moderna said its COVID-19 vaccine was actually linked to fewer breakthrough infections compared to Pfizer. And Moderna's CMO touted data from the CDC that showed 86 breakthrough cases per 100,000 for Moderna recipients and 135 breakthrough cases from Pfizer recipients. The CMO said the overall benefits of a Moderna shot outweighed the risk of rare heart inflammation that has been reported in a small number of young Moderna recipients. Data from France on males aged 12 to 29 also showed there were 13.3 cases of myocarditis per 100,000 Moderna recipients, whereas only 2.7 among Pfizer recipients. The number of myocarditis cases found among Moderna recipients was nearly five times more than what had been found from those who actually received the Pfizer shots. But the CMO defended use of the vaccine, saying that unvaccinated people are at an 11-fold increased risk of dying, whereas the reported heart conditions were generally mild. The CMO also said the company hasn't seen any cases of myocarditis, heart inflammation among those who received their booster shots, which have actually taken up half of Moderna's total distributed dosages of its primary series of shots. Right. Well, here in the country, we are using Moderna booster shots for those who received the Janssen uh, vaccine as well. Right. Yeah, let's now extend our talk to include Soa, who is first going to share with us the latest remarks by health officials here with regard to our COVID-19 situation. Right, Sunny. So the this Friday, health officials at their regular COVID-19 briefing have been really focusing on how to contain the virus among the young and old. And uh, as Yen mentioned earlier, the rising number of patients in severe or critical condition is becoming a growing concern, and especially at facilities that many seniors reside in or are being treated at. Health Minister Kon Dok this morning addressed the trend of rising COVID-19 infections among elderly patients and breakthrough breakthrough cases among them traced to cluster infections at nursing hospitals and care facilities. He said uh, these are prone to the virus due to caregivers and patients with existing health conditions residing together in groups. And in case the coronavirus gets transmitted through workers or visitations, taking care of seniors at such facilities will become more challenging. Prevention is our best strategy at facilities like these, rather than how we respond to an outbreak after it has already occurred. We're asking the management at nursing centers to cooperate with regional authorities in quickly administering booster shots and exercising thorough prevention. Right. And so what about the focus on young COVID-19 patients? Well, Sunny, as the vaccination rate among young people is at the lowest when it comes to teenagers, but of course, because the vaccination program for those aged 12 and uh, to 17 has kicked off later than the vaccinations for adults. And also uh, because those aged below 12 are not yet eligible, cluster infections in the academic arena are also becoming more frequent. And that's why the government has announced stronger antivirus measures related to children and teenagers this Friday, including more thorough inspections at frequently visited venues to protect the unvaccinated younger population. To prevent external factors from leading to transmissions at daycare centers, entry will only be allowed for fully vaccinated people or those that submit a negative PCR test result from the past 48 hours. Officials also mentioned that the increase in infections among teenagers also raises the risk of infections to the elderly who live with them, uh, which will be a challenge for the medical system. Uh, speaking of which, hospitals in the metropolitan region are working to secure more hospital beds ever since an administrative order was issued a week ago. By the end of today, we're looking to add more patient accommodations for moderately ill cases, so that in total, they will take up 1% of the total capacity of seven large hospitals in the capital region with 700 beds or more. With that, we're expected to secure 454 more hospital beds for moderate cases, on top of the 402 that were added by administrative order. 
And as for the current hospital availability in the nation, 58.8% of hospital beds for the severely or critically ill patients is currently being used, but that percentage is quite different in the metropolitan region. More than 75% in the capital Seoul is being used and 70.3% in Gyeonggi-do province, also 72.2% in Incheon. Now in the capital Seoul, it's even over 75%. 5.4 percent and uh, government officials have been mentioning that if we surpass that 75 percent threshold it can become dangerous and uh, that especially because around 8 out of 10 infections currently are happening in the capital region. Right and the government so has been updating the public almost daily about the country's medical capacity but in recent days there has been a shift in stance I understand. Right Sunny so it seems that way so let's uh, just take a listen to Igi the official again again on more on that stance. 79.2% of seriously and critically ill patients are seniors aged 60 and above. They also make up 96.8% of total fatalities. So the reality is the availability of hospital beds in our healthcare system in general are being strained. Talking about such strategy, Yeon, what has been shared about efforts to ease the strain in our medical system given the high number of senior patients in recent days? Right, so it's booster shots. Booster shots have been working as a very important element in Korea's COVID-19 strategy, and that's why authorities may consider narrowing the interval between booster shots and the original jab from six months to five. And this is specifically targeting senior citizens who are at much, much higher risk of death and hospitalizations. Also, they're thinking of administering boosters regularly to a broader age group from the beginning of next year. We don't really know this specific time yet because authorities are still in discussion. But to make booster shots more accessible to those eligible, starting today, those in the target groups can apply for surplus vaccines using Naver and Cacao Talk for same-day vaccinations. Right, so it has been made more convenient. Now speaking, staying with booster shots, so how many have received these extra doses thus far here in the country? Well, as of 12 a.m., the total number of people who got their additional doses stands at above 841,200. And more than 105,000 have gotten their uh, booster shots a day ago. And that number is even higher than the number of patients who got their first shot yesterday. Day. And uh, also when it comes to the vaccination for teens, as I mentioned teenagers before, that stands at 30.5% who got their first shot and 4.8% who are fully vaccinated. Uh, meanwhile, officials have also been stressing that it's uh, really uh, simple to get those vaccinations, those Pfizer shots when it comes to teenage vaccinations at any medical, almost any medical facility right now and uh, asked for stronger participation on uh, teenagers, especially mentioning three points. Uh, in fact, Infection risks are going up as we have transitioned into normalcy and also if uh, someone around you gets infected you have to get self-isolated uh, and that can also affect you academically and uh, I also found it interesting that one official mentioned that at the beginning of the pandemic and at the uh, rather at the beginning of our uh, vaccination campaign it was the senior citizens that got first vaccinated and that also protected the entire society of uh, not uh, seeing rising trends of infections but now uh, they are calling on the younger population, teenagers, to get more vaccinated so that they can also um, protect the elderly people and the society in overall. Right, so those who are fully vaccinated and if they do test negative after coming into close contact with somebody who is infected, they are exempt from the quarantine of, of two weeks, right? Exactly, so? yeah. All right, so as always, thank you very much for those updates and Yen, thank you very much for your input. Thank you. Seoul's finance ministry has shared an upbeat report of the country's economy with key indicators pointing to a gradual recovery. Our Min Su has more on these findings as well as the cause for caution amid the presence of variables. Major economic indicators are showing some signs of recovery amid a renewed surge of COVID-19 cases. The nation's industrial output in September edged up for the first time in three months. The growth was largely due to improved business conditions in the service industry, especially the food and beverage and accommodation sectors. 
This comes due to rapid vaccine rollouts and the handout of COVID-19 relief funds. Retail sales, a barometer of consumer demand, also bounced back in September as people bought more clothes and cosmetics. More good news is that consumption may rise further with this month's ease virus measures. Consumer sentiment increased in October for the second straight month after seeing falls in the previous months. With these figures, the finance ministry said it's likely that business conditions will gradually improve for in-person services. In its latest economic report, the ministry said there's a possibility that domestic demand will improve in the service sector following the so-called Living with COVID-19 scheme. However, it also called for risk control measures to cope with looming uncertainties. The ministry explained that uncertainty persists over a possible shift in monetary policies by major economies due to inflationary pressures. Uncertainties over supply chain disruptions was another concern that was mentioned. Min Suk Kyun, Arirang News. And starting on this Friday, fuel taxes are being cut by 20% as part of broader efforts to ease inflationary concerns. This measure will be in place for the next six months. Om Jiang reports. Drivers in South Korea are now able to fill up their tanks more cheaply with the record 20% tax cut. Starting on Friday, the country temporarily implemented its largest ever cut in fuel tax. Last month, the government and the ruling party agreed to slash the taxes amid global oil prices nearing three-year highs. To mitigate the impact of soaring international oil prices and a jump in gasoline prices, the government will temporarily slash taxes on gasoline, diesel and LPG by 20 percent. The measure will last for six months from November 12th to April 30th. As tax on oil accounts for roughly half of the total price, the cut has been applied in a bit to cope with inflation and ease the burden on people's daily lives. After the cuts, a liter of gasoline now should fall by an average of 164 won, or roughly 14 cents, with the liter of diesel down by around 10 cents and LPG around 3 cents a liter cheaper. That should save the average driver around $14 a month on gasoline. According to oil price researchers OPNET, the average gasoline price on Wednesday at gas stations nationwide was around 1801 or about $1.50, up around 7 percent on month. With the cut, the price will fall back to roughly 1601 or about $1.35. However, industry watchers say the tax cut is likely to take a couple of weeks to be reflected at all gas stations. As the demand for fuel at gas stations is likely to soar, the government is to cooperate with oil refineries so that they can run for 24 hours a day in order to supply fuel to local pumps as fast as possible. Om Jiang, Arirang News. Korea's import and export prices are maintaining their upward trend. Findings for October show the cost of imports in particular is looking to further push up consumer prices. Kim Sung-min has details. South Korea's import prices spiked in October, raising concerns that it'll further aggravate inflation. October's import figures jumped 4.8 percent from a month ago, rising for the sixth straight month. The import price index came to around 130.43, the highest in more than eight years. Compared to a year ago, it was up by 35.8 percent, the biggest jump in 13 years. This was largely due to rising prices of raw materials, with mining products like crude oil jumping more than 11 percent. Intermediate products made from coal or oil were up 10.9 percent on the back of surging global oil prices. Export prices also jumped 1.6 percent from September, continuing their upward trend for the 11th straight month. By item, intermediate products made from coal or oil jumped 12.3 percent, but computer and electronics prices dropped. In particular, semiconductors saw their first drop in price since last December, down 3.5 percent. Chip prices dropped for the first time this year as the demand for a non-contact lifestyle and services has declined, and also there have been issues in the global supply chain leading to bottlenecks. The surging prices of imports can result in higher consumer prices in the following months. South Korea has already seen the biggest surge in consumer inflation in more than nine years, jumping 3.2 percent in October. Kim Sung-min, Arirang News. 
Over in Beijing, the ruling Communist Party has endorsed a resolution that essentially cements Chinese President Xi Jinping's reign over the country for the years to come. Here's Yi Geng-un. China's ruling Communist Party approved a historical resolution that will help secure President Xi Jinping's leadership for at least another five years. Xinan News reported on Thursday that the pivotal document came at the end of the party's Central Committee's meeting, or Plenum, that ran for four days behind closed door in Beijing. The top political meeting brought together senior party officials who choose new leaders every five years. At the meeting, they approved the decision that marks the party's 100-year history and achievements and enshrines Xi's role as leader. An official summary read, under Mr. Xi's leadership, China has made historic achievements and undergone a historic transformation, including the economic success, foreign policy, fighting pollution, and containing COVID-19. The historical resolution is only the third of its kind since the party was founded in 1921. The previous resolutions were delivered by former leaders Ma Zedong and Deng Xiaoping and had the effect of consolidating their leaderships. A similar outcome is likely as it comes one year before Xi is expected to secure an unprecedented third term as party leader at a Congress that is held once every five years. There is no apparent rival in view. Experts have pointed to China's constitutional change that removes the two-term limit on the presidency and a recent push of propaganda praising the leader as possible evidence. The official media briefing on the meeting is set for Friday. Yi Yang-un, Arirang News. Back on the local front, an exposition this week in southern Seoul sought to offer companies here the chance to engage in business ventures with consumers abroad interested in Korean products and more. Kim bo reports. A wide range of sectors representing South Korea have all gathered at the COEX Convention and Exhibition Center in Seoul from Monday until Thursday as part of the combined K-Expo and annual On Hanryu Festival. The event is an effort to promote Korean businesses and content on a global scale. Cutting-edge technology from Korea, such as virtual reality and extended reality that can be used to dramatize online concerts, are among items being showcased. And of course, Korean cosmetics and Korean food are reaching a wider audience. Parasite-inspired hit food Zappaguri, a mix of Korean instant noodles and dried seaweed flavor, is among in-demand products for export, perhaps helped by pictures of BTS characters on the packaging. Though this product was only released in September, there has been a lot of demand from Japan and North America, so we are doing our best to meet that demand. Through the event, Korean companies have sought export and investment opportunities. One game company has been engaged in online business discussions as they try to find the right partner to work with in the Indonesian market. We are seeing each other for the first time online. Could you introduce your company? According to the Korea Creative Content Agency, 66 domestic content companies have participated in expert consultation with 52 buyers from overseas. As demand for online business meeting rises, the agency has strengthened its online B2B platform. Due to the pandemic, people cannot see each other. During these difficult times, we hope Hallyu can extend its boundaries by introducing Korean content online. Though its offline event is over, the expo will run until the end of the month alongside the On Hallyu Festival on the kexpo.kr website. Kim Bo-kyung, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. Former South African President F.W.D. Clark, who was also the last white president in the country, died at the age of 85 on Thursday. According to his foundation, he died peacefully following a struggle with cancer. Before he passed, he left a video message apologizing for apartheid. Therefore, let me today in this last message repeat, I, without qualification, apologize for the pain and the hurt and the indignity and the damage 
that apartheid has done to black, brown, and Indians in South Africa. I do so not only in my capacity as the former leader of the National Party, but also as an individual. The former president shared a Nobel Peace Prize with Nelson Mandela in 1993, though his role in the ending of apartheid remains highly contested. Many are still angered by his failure to curb political violence in the turbulent years leading up to 1994, when the nation's first multiracial elections were held. Still, in a day that was filled with mixed reactions over the passing of de Klerk, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa paid tribute to the late former leader, saying he played a vital role in the country's democratic transition. During the 11-day Singles Day sale period in China, the country's e-commerce giant Alibaba recorded over $84.5 billion in sales, marking a roughly 14 percent increase from a year earlier. The figure also came despite a much more toned-down Singles Day event, as many Chinese splurged on goods after almost two years of the COVID-19 pandemic. The more restrained event comes as the company seeks to shift its focus from sales growth to its efforts in sustainability and philanthropy, the key pillars of President Xi Jinping's drive to achieve common prosperity. Market experts also say a strong performance could ease concerns among its investors who are grappling with a 30 percent slump in Alibaba's shares this year. Hindu devotees in New Delhi were seen taking a dip by Yamuna River as they marked the religious festival of Shath Puja. While the scene would normally be nothing of concern, footages show the people taking a dip in what seems to be toxic foam forming in the river. The New Delhi government's water supply board blamed industrial waste and untreated pollutants from neighboring states for the worsening pollution. Chath Puja is a four-day festival which takes place on the sixth day after Diwali and holds significance for married women who fast, stand in waist-deep water, and present religious offerings to the sun god. Lee seung Arirang News. It's uh, time now for a check of these stories from this part of the world covered by foreign media in recent days. As always, I have Kim Sung Min here in the studio with me. Sung Min, uh, Sung Hyun, that is. Great <laughs> to have yes. you here again. Thank you. Good to see you, Sunny. Um, so we do have some more coverage uh, regarding Squid Game this week, um, particularly on season two that's uh, supposed to be in the works. Now, other stories I'll be talking about include Korea's pledge to phase out coal power, also, the submission of chip data by Korean firms at the request of the U.S. Commerce Department. So, let's dive right in. The global smash hit Squid Game will be returning for a second season. The creator of Squid Game, Hwang Dong-hyuk, said he is excited for season two, adding his fans left him with no other choice but to continue the show. Although Netflix has not yet officially confirmed the project, showrunner Huang himself confirmed that Squid Game will be back for round two in an inter interview with the Associated Press. Huang added that it's too early to say exactly when and how this will take place, but that he is currently in the planning stage. Meanwhile, the Washington Post also says the success of Squid Game has instilled confidence among emerging Korean filmmakers uh, that there is global interest in their work, especially regarding the subject of inequality and abuse of power. The Post said that these themes are now more relevant than ever before, with the wealth gap and economic anxieties becoming an increasingly global issue. Right. Now, Song Hyun, speaking about global issues, mm -hmm. let's touch upon the foreign media response to Korea's recent pledge for carbon neutrality. Carbon neutrality, right. Uh, a number of foreign media outlets were actually surprised, Sunny, by Korea's commitment to uh, phase out coal by the 2030s. Uh, a deal was struck at the UN Climate Summit last week to accelerate the end of coal, which is the single biggest uh, source other carbon emissions that cause climate change. Now, Forbes pointed out that in this agreement, 46 countries had committed to ending their use of coal, 23 of which were newcomers to the commitment. It went on to say that it was remarkable that five of the new signatories are among the heaviest users of the fossil fuel, one of them being Korea. 
uh, many global media outlets meanwhile also noted that the absence of some of the world's largest coal consumers including China and India while uh, saying Korea was among a club of nations that it is shifting away from fossil fuels with determination to avert the worst impact of climate change. Right. Meanwhile, in other news, Song Yeon, what has been said about Korea's recent disclosure of semiconductor-related information to the U.S.? Well, uh, Bloomberg made note of the news. Um, it did say that semiconductors have uh, become a major geopolitical issue lately. Um, Korean tech firms on Tuesday each submitted to its chip data to meet a deadline that had been set by the U.S. Commerce Department. The Korean Finance Ministry, it said uh, Korean tech firms had been negotiating with the U.S. on the extent of data to be submitted. The U.S. Commerce Department had earlier asked companies in the semiconductor supply chain to fill out questionnaires seeking information pertaining to their ongoing chip shortage. Washington's request has sparked controversy here in Korea, where critics have condemned it as an attempt to uncover local trade secrets. As expected, uh, Samsung Electronics along with SK Hynix, uh, which are the, the world's two largest chip makers, they only partially complied with the U.S. information request, with sensitive information being omitted. Now, in the meantime, global media outlets, um, they noted that semiconductors have become a serious uh, geopolitical concern uh, issue with Washington and Beijing seeking to secure supply chains for chips that are vital to daily life and the digital economy as well. Now, U.S. President Joe Biden uh, is seen to be bolstering U.S. trade links through Democratic allies like Korea so it can avoid chip shortages in times of crisis. Now, in the meantime, Korea's finance ministry did say the Seoul government will solidify its semiconductor supply chain partnership with the United States by continuing high-level communications. All right, that was our Kim Song Hyun <laughs> with the latest foreign <laughs> coverage of events here in this part of the world. Thank you, as always. Thanks for having me. Efforts to embrace a new normal are running into a few huddles. The number of seriously ill COVID-19 patients is on a relentless rise here on the local front, while over in Europe, the number of daily cases is rebounding to record levels. For more, I have Professor Kim moon gyu from Yonsei University. It's a pleasure to have you back, Professor Kim. Nice to meet you again. I also have Molly Quell, a freelance journalist over in the Netherlands, live on the line. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Molly. Good afternoon. Right, Professor Kim, we'll start with you here in the studio then. What do you believe is the reason behind the rapid rise in the number of seriously ill patients on the local front? I think almost all countries uh, changing quarantine policy to with corona are facing the surge of COVID-19 cases, not only Korea. Uh, theoretically, uh, if the surge is composed of mild cases, there will be no burden for the uh, ICUs, intensive care units. Uh, the key issue is how to ease the quarantine measure without compromising uh, COVID situation. And uh, uh, we can prepare for the worst with equipping more facilities like nasal high flow, ventilators, and ECMO and CRRT, etc. But we must remember that uh, this must come together with uh, the manpower. Um, we have very low reserve for medical personnel who are well trained to deal with that uh, severe cases, persons who can uh, deal with that machines also. So uh, they are already overloaded and because of this uh, pandemic, uh, there are many nurses and doctors quitting their jobs uh, who work in that uh, uh, intensive care units. And this is not only the problem with Korea. I think most of the uh, countries with uh, severe cases are facing the similar uh, uh, situation. So uh, uh, I hope that we learn from this pandemic that uh, we need a reserve of those uh, medical personnel. And to prevent the increase of severe cases will be the best solution.
Right, it would be. Uh, Molly, like I mentioned earlier, daily COVID-19 tallies over in Europe have been escalating in recent days, and I believe the Netherlands hit a fresh record with over 16,300 infections on Thursday. Tell us more about the COVID-19 situation there and efforts by medical institutions to better respond to the situation. Yeah, we uh, unfortunately broke our daily record for the pandemic yesterday, as you mentioned. Um, that's higher than it was in December of 2020, the number of uh, daily cases. We had 26 deaths yesterday, and uh, I guess it's probably important for your audience to remember that we're about one third the population size of South Korea. So it's about 17 million people that live in the Netherlands. Um, we have a lot of people in the hospital, a lot of people in intensive care. And uh, earlier in the week, at least one hospital has declared what they call a cold black, where they're turning away patients because they're fully at um, capacity and they can't they can't treat people anymore and this is uh, becoming a, a more serious problem especially because neighboring countries like Germany and Belgium are also having um, quite full hospitals and a bit of resurgence so there's not a lot of capacity for patients in the Netherlands to go somewhere else if they um, if the hospitals here are full are there any efforts on the part of the government then Molly to perhaps beef up support within the medical arena yeah, they've been trying to expand um, uh, ICU capacity, the, in the intensive care unit capacity um, here during the duration of the pandemic. Um, I think a, a bit as your previous, uh, uh, the person who was previously speaking just mentioned, what they're really having a struggle with is the number of medical personnel. Um, they've been having a lot of problems sort of keeping people, um, nurses and doctors in the in the field. Um, it's been quite difficult time and very, very stressful period for them. Um, so they're, they're, they are trying to do things, but it, it seems like, you know, what is being done is not sufficient to keep up with the, uh, the rate of infection. Right. And staying within the medical are arena, that is, Professor Kim, authorities have mentioned that the country's medical system can accommodate up to 500 seriously ill patients. And we appear to be nearing that figure. What are your prospects with regard to the rise in se severely ill patients? Do you see a further rise? Do you suppose the figure will stand on the 400 level? There is a high, high, there is a high possibility that uh, severe cases might go over 500. I would say that there is no break to stop the surge if it gets to gets the speed and inertia. So the worst scenario might be uh, uh, like uh, exponential sp spread. Uh, which uh, ex Israel and Singapore and Germany has experienced. Uh, we, don't, we do not have many options except vaccination and social distancing uh, for now until we have a new drugs available. Again, uh, vaccination for high-risk groups and uh, if they are un unvaccinated and also booster, sh booster shots for these groups are uh, urgent right now. Right, as mentioned by our colleagues earlier on. Meanwhile, Molly, how are authorities in the Netherlands explaining the persistent rebound that is in daily infections in Europe or in the Netherlands itself? Well, there, there's been a, you know, the, the Dutch are a, are a people that believe very strongly in personal responsibility and the party line sort of of the current government is, is that the only way out of this crisis is for people to sort of adhere to the, the measures that are in place um, and that they, you know, they have to stick to the rules. Um, and they have to, you know, sort of use common sense. Um, the situation in the Netherlands is, is, is sort of the similar as it is to surrounding countries, Germany and Belgium, Luxembourg, Austria. These places are also having a huge rise. I mean, it's winter here. It is cold and wet. People are indoors. You know, I think that that leads to a situation where you're inevitably going to have an increase in infections in a respiratory pandemic. Right. And that is why last week, Dutch authorities, Molly, I believe, reintroduced face masks and expanded the list of venues that require what are being called Corona passes there and not vaccine passes. Tell us more. Yeah, that's correct. So last week on Tuesday, they they um, put forth some expanded measures um, where, as you mentioned, um, they're now requiring face masks again in shops. They had only been required on public transportation for a long period of time and um, are also requiring more and more places to use, to do a, what they're calling here a QR code check, where basically you either have to show that you've been vaccinated or that you've tested negative within the last 48 hours. Um, and tonight there's going to be another press conference where they're going to have to introduce some more measures. Uh, at the beginning of the week, they were, 
I think floating some looser restrictions, maybe just a bit more of this QR code testing and, and a few other things, perhaps reducing the size of events. But given yesterday's daily record, I, I think they're going to have to do some, uh, some things that are a bit stricter. Right. And Professor Kim, a weekly analysis by the WHO shows Europe accounting for more than 60% of all global infections during the first seven days of this month, that is November. What are your thoughts on the resurgence over in Europe? If there is an increase in critical cases, this is uh, very worrisome. Uh, many European countries show a surge in COVID-19 cases, such as Netherlands, Germany, and there's a mild increase in uh, France, Italy, and Russia. And I think Sweden is, is in a stable situation, and there's a little bit decrease in UK right now. Each country needs evaluation and analysis, but there might be possibly related to the easing of social distancing with the other uh, weather factor. Uh, we have to remember that the uh, majority of European countries are already vaccinated and they even started booster shots. I hope that uh, mortality will not increase together with the uh, total cases, but uh, Russia, UK, Germany, Netherlands, they're already showing the pattern of uh, increasing of the uh, mortality. So uh, wearing masks will be more important than we think, and maybe we have to continue that all through that, uh, all through this pandemic. Right, and along with wearing masks, Molly, later on this Friday, over in the Netherlands, authorities will decide on whether or not to impose a partial lockdown, I understand, that will last about two weeks. Could you tell us a bit more about the measures within the latest proposal of a uh, partial lockdown? So what has um, leaked sort of from the government as of yesterday is, is that they're actually looking at a three-week lockdown. Um, they're talking about closing bars and restaurants at uh, 7 o'clock. Um, it will expand the use of QR codes to include places like zoos, um, and that they're going to talk about canceling events, large events with people, no sort of public at uh, sporting events, this kinds of things. It seems likely that schools will remain open. And next week on Tuesday, the parliament will debate some further measures. There was a number of things that were introduced here, like the mandatory social distancing rules. They were implemented under an emergency law. And in order to bring them back, they're going to have to change um, the sort of legal justification for it. Molly, how is the public responding to the possibility of another partial though, lockdown? I mean, I don't think anybody is happy about it. Um, I, don't, I don't think anybody enjoys sort of being in lockdown. Um, the Netherlands, I think, like a lot of countries, has a small but very vocal minority. Um, there was people who were out protesting last weekend, about 20,000 of them against the, the corona measures. But more broadly, people seem to accept the idea that we need to do something. I think a lot of people know people personally who have gotten corona in the, in the previous days. I mean, with these sorts of numbers in such a small country, inevitably you're going to know folks who have uh, tested positive. And when I talk to people, when you see people being interviewed on the news, they, you know, they begrudgingly seem to accept the fact that like we need to do some more things here. So, I mean, I, I think most people will sort of accept what needs to be done. Right. Professor Kim, compared to Europe where exit strategies saw a near complete lifting of all uh, prevention measures, Korea's transition into a new normal has been rather cautious. The wearing of face masks is still mandatory here and business hours are still being restricted for some uh, entertainment uh, venues. What are your thoughts on this discrepancy? Uh, COVID-19 is uh, different from previous beta corona viruses such as uh, SARS in 2003 and MERS in 2012. It can actively spread before symptoms starts. So that's the key point we have to remember. Personally, I agree that easing quarantine measures should be uh, gradual, especially for people gathering in a confined space, a lot of drinking, speaking, and uh, may, may might have close uh, physical contacts. But uh, elementary school and junior high school should might not be closed again because uh, I think there is more loss than gain. And uh, instead of that, as I mentioned, taking care of the high-risk groups and uh, keep continuing uh, vaccination program will be important.
Right. Molly, meanwhile, the decision by authorities there in the Netherlands to lift COVID-19 measures completely, well, to embrace a new normal, was on the back of the country's high vaccination rate. What can you tell us, Molly, about that rate right now? So the number of uh, eligible people to be vaccinated in the Netherlands who are fully vaccinated is, uh, is about 85%, 84 point something. Um, and the number of people with the first shot is a bit higher. I think it's about 87. Um, amongst the elderly, that number goes up even more. It's sort of around 90%. Um, and even kind of teenagers, um, they sort of opened up the, um, the, el the age range eligibility a few months ago so that 12 to 17 year olds could also be vaccinated. And there it's somewhere about 60% of that, that population is, uh, is vaccinated. So the numbers here are vaccination rate is, is, is quite high, obviously not high enough because we still have unvaccinated people and those are making up the majority of the people who are in intensive care, but it is, it is much higher than it is in some other places. And are there any other efforts, Molly, being made to perhaps further encourage members of the public to take vaccinations, to receive their vaccines? Yeah, they've been um, pushing for a lot of these things. They've, they've been doing some things where they're sort of taking vaccine buses into neighborhoods where they, um, they don't have such a high um, a rate of vaccination to try to encourage people to get vaccinated. Um, I live in a town with a big university and they've set up some university, um, some places on the university campus um, where, they, where people are eligible to get vaccinated. And there's a push here also to get younger people vaccinated. So to open it up from um, you know, five to 12 year olds like they've done in the United States. And what is the response to that, opening up vaccinations for those children below the age of 12? I think people seem broadly positive about it. I mean, again, there are people who are sort of vaccine hesitant or, or skeptical about getting vaccines, but they're, they're a small sort of uh, portion of the population. Um, my impression from people who have young kids is, is that they want their kids to be safe, that it seems like the vaccines are quite safe and that getting their kids vaccinated will get us all out of this situation faster. Right, hopefully. And Professor Kim, what are your thoughts on the possibility of an alarming rebound in cases here in Korea, as is the case over in the Netherlands, as we push forward with our gradual ease in COVID-19 prevention measures? Um, there is ample evidence that Korea might uh, have the same surge of cases. And uh, one thing I would like to mention is uh, unidentified infections. I mean, we have unidentified cases because it might have an asymptomatic uh, infection. And nobody knows the whole picture of that. And since the uh, Korea maintained in a very good situation for a long time since the pandemic, so we might have uh, less uh, unidentified infection compared to uh, Netherlands and other European countries. So if we have a surge, it might have a real big impact uh, in Korea. So uh, we have to consider that uh, risk and uh, uh, easing uh, uh, quarantine measures is something uh, should be uh, our own. I mean, Korea has uh, Korea's own situation. So I think the government is considering and uh, uh, they will make conclusions soon. Yeah. Right. And talking about the government here, Molly, authorities in Korea are underscoring the importance of booster shots to fight off breakthrough infections. How is the booster campaign being implemented over there in the Netherlands? They've opened up booster shots for the elderly um, and people who work in healthcare, and also for people who are living in sort of care home facilities. Um, and those shots are going to start in December. Um, there's been a bit of criticism here about that because, of course, places like the United Kingdom have already started with booster shots. And I think people here would like to see this being rolled out a bit faster, but that is the current plan. I see. Meanwhile, Professor Kim, COVID-19 vaccinations may become an annual event here in Korea, as is the case of the seasonal flu inoculations. And if that is the case, what are some things worth considering before making COVID-19 vaccinations an annual event here? The pattern of this pandemic will decide the need for yearly vaccination, uh, whether COVID-19 vaccine should be repeated annually or not. But before we conclude about this, uh, we must have more data on the safety and effectiveness of the vaccines which is currently available. And uh, we also have to look for new vaccines which has a comparable uh, effectiveness and also maybe have better results such as uh, Novavax, we don't know yet. But. And uh, we need 
to make efforts to make uh, new vaccines which might cover the possible future pandemic also. And uh, if it goes successful, it might cover the whole family of a beta coronavirus. And they will put a name on this vaccination as a pan-corona vaccine. And uh, I hope that will come in, in the future. But uh, we have to come back to the same uh, uh, story that comparing benefit and harm. So always benefit should be more than harm to uh, start any kind of uh, vaccine program. Right, of course. Molly, one final question to you. I, as you mentioned, schools will remain open in the Netherlands, even in the event of a partial lockdown. What measures then are in place within the academic arena to ensure safety there? They're requiring mask wearing um, for uh, high school and also at the university level. So um, when you're sort of uh, moving around in the classrooms, there's some restrictions on the number of people who can be in a single room. So for example, in the, in the school canteens and these sorts of things. And they've been trying to stagger arrival times to sort of ease the burden on um, like public transit and, and congestion to kind of minimize the number of sort of large groups of people that are kind of gathering before school or in one small confined space before school. What about the idea of remote classes taking place? Is that an option on the table? I mean, this is what they had to do earlier during the pandemic. So I suspect that that will be an option that's put back on the table if the numbers keep going this badly. I mean, I think broadly speaking, parents have been very frustrated with this and that nobody is really enjoying the remote schooling situation. I think it's quite difficult to sort of do your job while you're trying to make sure your you know, seven-year-old is learning maths. Um, so I, I think we'll see. They, they've still been continuing some remote stuff for um, uh, students who are really at high risk, uh, sort of people with severe asthma, that sort of thing. Um, so I, I think it could continue. I, I think it's just, um, you know, very important. I think that most people, that the, the children go to school. I think the educational experience is better. This is kind of what the experts say. And so I, I suspect that that's really going to be a measure of last resort for them to return to some kind of remote schooling. Right, I see. And finally, my final question to you, Professor Kim. Korea itself is planning to fully reopen the academic arena on the 22nd of November. What are your thoughts on this as a medical expert yourself? Well, uh, uh, vaccine is necessary for some uh, students mm. in that age if they have uh, underlying disorders. So uh, uh, some parents are reluctant to get vaccinated, but I highly recommend it that uh, they should have a corona vaccination if the doctors are recommending. And what about uh, the healthy uh, students uh, attending elementary school and junior high schools? Well, uh, from the uh, Academy uh, Social uh, Society of Pediatrics in Korea, they are uh, insisting that uh, parents should be fully uh, explained and they have to agree, then understand the whole situation, the benefits and uh, the side effects. and. Uh, uh, people, uh, students should be vaccinated somehow, uh, at least once, I think. That's my personal uh, uh, opinion. In order to ensure complete safety within the uh, academic arena then? Yes. I see. Yes. All right, Professor Kim, as always, thank you very much for your insights. And thank you. Molly, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts at this very early hour at your end. Yeah, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Right, well, Korea is looking ahead to its second weekend amid East COVID-19 restrictions. So do seek to abide by the basic regulations in place to ensure a safe and sustainable transition into life with COVID-19. Thank you for watching. See you on Monday.